we are at the Titan Missile Museum. It's the second day of the year, 2018. Okay, we're at the bottom of the access portal. We're 35 feet below the ground surface. You're sitting right where the crew would have stood. The commander would have made the final phone call right here. He'd make his first, last phone call there. Last door six you saw in the movie. If um, everything was okay, these commander inside would energize this box at the same time. The commander out here would hit the open button, retracting his four pins. And then the lowest man on the totem pole then would open up that um, door. But I would hate to hang that door too, because you know how heavy that door is? Anybody remember? Three tons. Three tons, 6,000 pounds. That'd be a bear to get it down there. But in any case, they'd open up that door, bring their stuff, supplies in here. This is the blast lock area. They would then close this door, hit the close button, re-engaging those pins. Only then should they open up this door here. These two are paired together and we have two other doors paired together. This blast lock protects the crew from external blast. That blast lock protects the crew from an internal blast like a missile mishap. Oh, come on in. Apologies. <laughs> Small groups, we got plenty, we got four cheers here. Anybody celebrating a birthday or an anniversary today? No. I just need a volunteer for a commander. I'll do it. You're there you go. Have <laughs> you ever served in the military? I have not. Okay. Well, we'll I'm call this my you, first time. I'm going to make you a captain. If you want to sit, sit there. There's a blue chair back there. Get comfortable, folks. Now, if some adults want to sit, we're going to get up, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> As for people like me, that's old and need You're to supposed to know all this. You're supposed to know it like a bat. <laughs> Learn it. Learn it. Guys. Learn it. Okay, let's talk about this facility first. Upstairs is the crew's quarters. If you've ever stayed at a Motel 6 in your life or covered in, you've been in a five-star hotel compared up there. Sometimes folks get upset we don't go up there. I work with commanders and other crew members. I can't get them to go up there. So it was cold and noisy. That's all that you need to know about it. This is where they wanted to be right here. It was cold and noisy here, but at least you had your other crew team members. And down below this is equipment area. Now, you don't see any springs on this equipment today, and it looks pretty important. What we did was we took layer one, connected to level two, level three to level two, and suspended all three layers off of the dome with these eight massive springs around us. There's one back there, one there, one there. So we're sitting in that stone, and because of that space you climbed over, called the rattle space, we could go side by side 11 inches and up and down about 18 inches. And you wouldn't even spill your coffee or Coke, whichever one is your preference. Now, we have the EMP shield around us. What about that blast wave? Remember that ventilation shaft we talked about? It's right behind this wall here. Remember the first Tipsy assist right above you, Commander. And then we have that yellow band on the ground, and this is the um, ventilation shaft that comes right behind that wall and comes through this little hole here and provides all the air for the complex. So this big old silver device does the same thing as that um, blast door does. It's called a blast valve. It will automatically slam shut a two pounds per square inch or greater, protecting us and the equipment from that blast wave. And then we go on down to level three where there's a hatch right below this thing that's used to open, be opened by the crew to climb in and climb up. So that takes care of that. Now, Commander, you're in charge of this facility. You've got to know your lights and you have to know your procedures. Oh boy. I know. <laughs> that's right. That's green. There you go. <laughs> and, and red and amber is bad. Flashing with horns is really bad. I don't know why they made those red. 
but that was your security entry point for that blast door six that was out of security. So the bottom row deals with facilities, fire systems, and gates to open and close. The middle system system deals with the missile itself, the reentry vehicle, missile, and critical power. Up top deals with the targeting, sequencer to launch this thing, and then communications. Got it? The one thing you must make sure everyone follows is procedures. This book is like your Bible here. SAC does not like anybody improvising. In fact, people lose their lives and assets are lost because people try to improvise. If it's not a step in that book, you don't do it. And that's your job to make sure everyone follows the procedures as you call them out. Now, you and your deputy have locks. You were assigned these locks when you graduated Miss Lear School. See this red safe here? All the top secret goodies are in that safe. I was just telling one guy today while you met him, Norm, your briefer, he used to be SAC, um, in SAC, and he was uh, at the time Air Police, and then it became Security Police. I was telling him, he was asking about the picture he saw of this place. I said, well, none of this was really top secret. We used to have Girl Scout troops down here. What was top secret was inside that red safe, and that red safe better be secure unless you have top secret access. Now, you came in here with your lock, and your deputy came in here with your lock. You got with a off-going crew officers, and they took their locks off, opened up that safe, and oh, by the way, the other crew members had to be out of this area. They had to be upstairs or downstairs. And you took inventory of that safe, and if you agreed everything was in there, it's supposed to be in there, you then close that safe, put your locks on it, and by the way, you know your combination, you don't know his, and vice versa. And you would then sign a log right here. That was taking responsibility for the site, and that's when your 24 hours begun. Only then. So you can see if there's a rattlesnake up there, the crew really wanted you to down here signing off on that log, so most likely they let you slip. Now your deputy, either first or second lieutenant, you'd be a captain or a major, working your way out of here so you'd go fly jets, and he or she was working their way into that chair to be commander. And you know they had women on these crews, right? You all know that? Really? Yeah? Yeah, you know, because you've been here. <laughs> it used to be a men's club, though. Up until 1977, it was a all men's club. Then Congress enacted legislation mandating women to serve in combat roles. So in 1978, the Air Force integrated women into, this, into these um, um, squadrons. In fact, our museum director, Yvonne Morris, sat in that very chair in 1982 as this particular site's missile combat crew commander. So I can't imagine a bigger weapon than a 9 megaton thermal nuclear weapon to give anybody. It's definitely a combat role. But in any case, your deputy is in charge of communications, security, and safety. All those antennas we talked about terminate into this rack here. This is that little sliffy radio we talked about, but just it's data only, not extremely slow. Probably would never get a message from that if we're at war. Security, if you heard this, then you two are armed with 38s, but you don't go running up top. You guys know what this is, right? I'm the president. I'm assuming. You know what this is? No? It's a rotary telephone. You knew what that was, right? <laughs> I think so. Most kids don't. Yeah, most kids don't. They're been exposed. So you use this high-tech 1963 rotary telephone and, and call the base. <laughs> the president doesn't want to hear about your alarm up top. <laughs> You know why we don't use those, right? They weren't. They don't dial fast enough. And they don't text. Yeah, that's true. No <laughs> screen to play games. It's totally worthless as a communication device, right? Oh, yeah. It only communicates. In any case, you would dial up there, they would issue the security police and let them deal with up top. You're a Fort Knox down here. Nobody's getting in here. Not anytime soon. Now, safety. Kind of segues in from security because anyone coming in here would have to go through the same security you all just did. We might have maintenance personnel up to 50 people on site at any one time. So the deputy also had to keep up with location of everybody at all times, including their own crew members. In case we get a launch order, we know exactly where they are, we know how many there are, and we can get them in here really quick. And then this clock here is an eight day wind up clock called the EWO clock. Well, on every Sunday morning by the deputy, but twice a day, the deputy would dial in the radio frequency to Boulder, Colorado's atomic clock and adjust this to within one second accuracy at all times. Now, if you notice, it's 1108, 1109, 
and that's showing 1809, so there's a seven hour difference there. Anybody know where that's set to? London. London, close, it's right outside of London. It's GMT, yep. Yeah. But the military will not give the British credit. They call that Zulu time for zero meridian. All military and our allies operate off that time, so there's no AM, PMs, or time zones to deal with. So no matter where you are in the world, that's what time it is if you're in the military. Our commercial airliner are on the space station. So we'll, we're going to launch our missile based off of that time. Your uh, third person is enlisted personnel, typically a sergeant, in charge of the maintenance and all the things that go into this facility to make it run. You have pumps, motors, chillers, hydraulics, pneumatics, fire systems, electrical systems is especially important because we rely on electricity. In fact, we buy it off a local utility. If you saw the picture of this site in 1962, you didn't see any Green Valley. It's up there in the hallway. You can take a look at it. So we had a very weak distribution line coming out here, and we had a lot of outages. The problem with an outage is on that missile, we have a massive computer, all four kilobytes worth of computer <laughs> memory on it. But it was connected to a guidance platform that had to spin continuously. If it had a one-second outage, the gyro spin down, but also, that computer has to be rebooted. And it wasn't just like it is today, you know, controlled off and delete. It was quite a, quite a chore. So it took about six hours to relearn and reboot that system. Not an easy task. So this panel here would monitor incoming power. As long as that switch is in auto, when it senses the outage, it turns on a generator on level three. But it takes 60, 90 seconds to get that generator connected onto the uh, bus work to do any good. In the meantime, that's way too long. So the engineers built something that we take for granted today, but down below us are two big batteries each the size of this console that provide an uninterruptible power source for everything you see in green here. 28 volts DC, that missile's 28 volt DC. I already said we operate that door off DC. So we can launch that missile solely on those batteries many, many hours after we lose power if the generator does not come up to speed. Your last person is a BMAT, Ballistic Missile Analyst Technician. Again, a sergeant, enlisted airman. Now in the 60s, who knew anything about computers? Everybody I've talked to couldn't even spell the word in the 60s. They didn't mm -hmm. even know what a computer was. In fact, I worked with a guy on Wednesdays, um, Fred. He flew on looking glass for nine years, was made a career out of the Air Force. In 1960, his commanding officer said, Fred, I need you to go to MIT. Okay. We need you to learn about computers. Okay. And the officer said, is there any questions? Yeah. What's a computer? <laughs> and his officer said, no, I don't know. That's why we're sending you. <laughs> so the people just didn't know. It wasn't common. So this person was highly trained in computers. Spent a lot of time with this panel. Could do all sorts of non-destructive testing up to, but not including launching that missile. So when you and your deputy turn those keys, we can be sure that missile's going to fire. This panel here is part of the control panel. We're going to see that this thing, when it takes off, is launched in 58 seconds. That was a game changer. In 1963, when these came on, the Atlas F and the Titan ones, which preceded this missile system, took an average of 28 minutes to launch. So this could sneak a fast one in on us. Because all we had, we had no satellites. All we had was a dew line along the Arctic radar system that would capture their ballistic missiles inbound to us. By that time, we had 15 minutes to respond before they started landing in the continental U.S. So obviously, 28 minutes was not cutting the mustard, but when we went to 58 seconds, it definitely did. Now, up until 1975, though, the Air Force um, realized that we didn't really have the best security in the world here. You could have an unauthorized or accidental launch of this missile. And if you did, out of one of these 54, that'd be a starter of World War III. And we don't start it, we finish it. We're a retaliatory system. So the Air Force installed this device called a butterfly control valve. Very simple but effective. Basically, there's four valves underneath stage one rocket, two for the air zine, two for the fuel. When they open up, these propellants come together in the nozzle and they explode. It's hypergolic action. It just doesn't burn. It's a violent explosion. Very reliable. So, the Air Force installed a locking mechanism on one of the oxidizer lines. That's controlled by this code here. If the code's not entered in, this does not unlock and we cannot have a launch. 
Now that code is a six digit code with 16 alpha characters each. So that's 16 to the six, Commander, of combinations. I know you know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't feel bad, Bill Gates thing. Yeah, yeah Bill Gates thing. Same right. as the lottery. <laughs> I had a woman sitting in here two or three weeks ago. She ended up taking my top to bottom tour as well. She was a computer and electronics geek. She just really got into this stuff, which is fun to see. But she started mumbling, mumbling when I asked the commander there that question. She was 24 to the fourth. 16,777,216. Wow. And she was right. And she did not cheat. She had not been here before. <laughs> so her mind works differently okay but she got it right that's a big combination but not enough security for the Air Force so they also hardwired this is Davis mom that if you touch any of this commander you're gonna get a call on the phone from a colonel saying you must be under duress because surely you're touching this thing that's why they have this panel there you can't get to it then lastly they have a try counter on the seventh incorrect try it will commit suicide and lock out permanently so the eighth or the 80th correct code entry will not make a difference it takes a very specialized crew to come out here and reset all this stuff because that's a top secret deal right there. So, no one touched it. Now, we have three targets here, don't we, Commander? Yes. Which one's lit? Two. You got that one. That was pretty easy, right? Yeah. Tell us everything there is to know about two. Um, it's got a light on there. That's one good answer. <laughs> and there's nothing in my notes. Nothing in your notes. Where's it going? Uh, where's it going? Yeah. Do you know where it's going? Let's see. Um, see anything there that says anything? Central Moscow. Oh, we don't know that. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say I don't see the answer. And you were absolutely <laughs> correct. The crew, the crew did not know. Okay. You know, it was top secret. Think about this, we had 30, 35,000 nuclear weapons at the time. Yeah, that's a lot of nuclear weapons, isn't it? 35,000. We only had 54 of these systems, right? 54, small number, right? These 54 represent one third of all our nuclear tonnage. That's a huge destructive package. So, targets one, two, or three must be a high value, highly strategic target to represent one of these being used for that asset. So, we don't know, our enemy, we didn't want to know, so very classified, because you don't have to fly it, you just have to turn the key. Mm -hmm. It is probably still targeted today, it's still probably a high value target even today. But we do know what it's going to do when it gets to target two. It's going to detonate on the ground, it's going to make a hole 400 foot deep by three quarters of a mile wide. That's a big hole. If you ever been to Winslow, Arizona, see Meteor Crater, that's a nine megaton hole. Now we're only 35 feet deep. Heck, the silo is only 147 foot deep. So I don't care where you go, you're not going to survive a direct hit. So we're going after something deep and hardened. It's a bunker-busting bomb. Now, if we take the same weapon and go to one or three, they are set for an airburst. An airburst, when it gets there, could be 6,300 nautical miles from here. It's a pretty good way. And in 30, 35 minutes, it will detonate in the air and destroy 900,000 square miles. I know that's hard to comprehend how big that is. So take two Phoenixes, two LAs, one New York City, one Washington, one Chicago, destroyed. It's a city destroyer. To put that into perspective, the first atomic weapon we dropped on Hiroshima was a 15 kiloton. This is 600 times more powerful than that one atomic weapon. And that one atomic weapon destroyed four square miles, okay? It'd make it even worse if you add up everything we dropped in World War II. I'm a proponent of everything dropped in World War II from us, our allies and enemies, both in the European and Pacific arena. Add in those two atomic weapons, you get two and a half megatons. It's a nine megaton weapon. It's three times more powerful than everything dropped in World War II. Okay? Times it by 54, you get 200 World War IIs unleashed in 58 seconds. That's called peace through deterrence. And before you feel bad for them, they got 66 point at us at 20 megatons. So if they start World War III, we will finish it. And the world's finished too. So peace through deterrence, otherwise it becomes mutually assured destruction. No one wins. Okay, these panels are used by the MFT for critical power monitoring and sequencing of power. This big thing is called the Missile Guidance Alignment Checkout Group, or the GAC. Just a fancy name for a device that was invented in the 50s that was made to 
make sure the guidance platform knew where True North was at all times. Now, they only had a 10 year lot for this program, so they only bought enough parts for 10 years. By 73, 74, we were running out of parts for this thing. And you know that memory core, four kilobytes? IBM stopped making it a long time ago, so we couldn't even get parts for that. So it got critical. So the Air Force approached MIT, just, which were the original designers of this equipment, just happened to be that they were working on a new system with Boeing under contract for the 747 called the Universal Space Guidance System. They took that same technology, put it in here, upgraded that computer and system, got up to 16 kilobytes, vastly improved the accuracy of the missile system, and easily extended the life 10 additional years. We get that targeting in with this high-tech punch paper tape. Why would we use this thing? That's all you have. Well, we have it today, though. We still use this today. Because it's not hack-proof. There's no connectivity. Can't give it the virus. Can't erase it. I'm an engineer. I know nine different languages, and I cannot read holes. I've tried. I can't read this stuff. So I'm convinced you could hand this to Putin over in Russia, and he wouldn't be able to use it. So it's a very secure means to provide highly classified information like the targeting is. So we read through these rules in here, and we put it over in that safe. Now, you're sitting here, Commander, you're smoking your cigarette. <laughs> Deputy doesn't get a cigarette. He's working their way into that chair, and you hear this. Two message. That's a launch message, Commander. We know that one. It never came, but today it came. So we write down everything that man says. At the end of that message, he says to say again, we swap our books. You check my work, I check your work. If we're in agreement, we wrote everything he said, and it is a launch message, we now have permission to go over that safe. Because what do we have to do with every launch message? We have to make sure it's from the President of the United States, and we do that with these things. They're called authenticator cards. On the second line, seven characters, we look at the very first two characters and find the card that matches that. Say it's Whiskey Delta, we break that open. We pull out the information on the inside and it has seven characters. If they match that second line in full, we have the full authority of the leadership to launch this missile. The next line down is that butterfly code and you thought it was in that safe. It just came in with the launch message. Very secure code. You read out to the BMAT. He or she puts it in, hits that button, we're locked and loaded. We're a rifle ready to fire. And which is, we're getting to the next point. The next two lines deal with the time to launch. World War III is a highly choreographed event. We don't want our missiles slamming into each other as they go over the northern regions. We don't want to land on a B-52 at all. However, knowing that Davis Moffat is the fourth largest standing Air Force in the world, I guarantee you they're part of the first strike from Moscow. So. I imagine these are out pretty quick. We decode that time. We put it on the EVO clock so there's no confusion. Hey, it's time to launch. Go back and we get our keys. You put your key here. I put my key here. It's seven foot apart. It takes two to turn these things. They turn clockwise and they're spring loader. You ready to launch this puppy? Yeah, there you go. You've been here before. <laughs> well trained commander. When I say marks, please turn it to the three o'clock position and hold it. Three, two, one, mark. Tell me when that green light pops on. Fine. Okay, release. What he and I did is the same as pulling a trigger on a rifle. There is no oops button. There's no I wish I hadn't done this button. There's no diversion button. If the president called you up and said, Commander, I made a mistake, too you late. could just hang up. It's too late because you've got better things to do right now, like prepare for World War III. Right next to that is batteries activated. I mean, we, we have two batteries on board that missile. It's the very first time we're force feeding it electrolytes. It will come up to full charge in 28 seconds. When it does, it just then, it's now auxiliary power source, meaning it's powered from this point to impact. We just now open up the silo door. Pretty quick, huh? Silo saw. Guidance has now talked to the targeting computer for the last time. Things are happening really fast. We're dumping water at the bottom of that silo. We are opening up these pre-valves and we're locking up the thrust mount. When these fully open, we're going to light charges off to spin the turbo up and we get this. And then we get this. What's this say? Lift off. Lift off. Mm -hmm. Is that fast? Now that missile has cleared that solid. It is now heading for two and a half minutes under first stage thrust, 50 miles high, 50 miles north. Which time it's going to drop off. Stage two is going to take it for two and a half minutes. Stage two is going to take it for the next three minutes, 200 miles into space, and drop away. And then that ballistic missile is going to coast. 
until it gets right over to where target, target two, two is. It's going to air the atmosphere at 16,000 miles per hour, strike the ground at 600 miles an hour, and in 30, 35 minutes, I would not want to be eating a Big Mac in target two because mm. it's going to be gone. So, congratulations, Commander. You failed your mission. What? What? <laughs> how much, how much of a vibration that caused? You would never hear it here. You would never just know. Just because of the springs and all. Well, just in an isolated buck around, you would just, it's so noisy in here, you would never know it. Yeah. In fact, they, they proved that at, at Vandenberg because they would have launches there and the crews would actually fire it. And they would never know. Screwed you up, failed huh? your mission. You know why? Your I mission was never to turn that key. Oh. <laughs> and we, we succeeded in that mission. But you did a great job turning that key. I did. Yep. you got to put out your fires. you got to close that door because we're going to get hit. And if you survive the initial slot, onslaught, you want to hear the good news or the bad news? The bad news. You're going to die. <laughs> Not the good news. you got plenty of food for 30 days and water for 30 days. But you're going to die. Okay? <laughs> be it now, be it in 17 days, or be when you go up to the surface. Because we're in the middle of the desert. There are no vehicles up there. There's no water up there. The world's been destroyed. stand a strike if a nuclear blast occurs it's going to try to push that door down into the earth so it must hold that up too so here it is you don't know it's any money that's good news too because if it launched it's two and a half million dollars <laughs> now that's 63 dollars and i'd be okay with that yeah <laughs> this is serial number n10 it came off the assembly line of martin at littleton colorado the 10th one it was destined to be shot off as a research missile, but instead it was diverted to Shepard Air Force Base in Wichita Falls, Texas. It was used as a training aid for anybody that had anything to do with the Titan II missile. So everyone trained on this. We were fortunate to get it because it never had propellants loaded on. Therefore, we could put it in the silo and not worry about making anybody sick in here because the off-gassing would still be occurring with that toxic mm -hmm. propellants. In fact, we competed with the Smithsonian and we won because they didn't have a silo, we did. So theirs is up top in the open. Now, anybody Star Trek fan? Good. I was about to call it quits on the tour. <laughs> Star Trek was filmed here, first contact. Mm -hmm. So, um, Captain Picard and Data touched our missile. It just happened to be the Phoenix Warp Drive at the time. It stood right here and touched it. This was also the place and location of a horrible accident that occurred in September 18, 1980 at the Masses, Arkansas. Two propellant crew members were putting the cap back on this vent line that they use to charge up nitrogen with, or vent nitrogen, and the socket, eight pound socket fell from this location, hit 100 foot down onto the thrust mount and hit the missile itself. Poked a hole into the missile because the skin is the fuel tank. It's only a down thick up here, it's a quarter thick down below. They didn't double wall them, that'd be too heavy. And when it did, they didn't have procedure to address it. And they will not do anything without a procedure. So they were trying to develop one, and then the missile said, I'm going to do it for you. It blew up. Went high with Golic. Took that 760-ton door above us and slung it at a football field west. Wow. Took the RV and slung it at a football field east. And luckily, it didn't detonate. If it had, we would have lost Arkansas, and most of the surrounding states would have been highly contaminated from the radiation. A ground burst is a horrible thing. People think, well, it's just 400, 400 foot deep. It's all the dirt it throws up really bad. So, there's two other windows down here you have a better view. I encourage you to come over here. Now again, this is 103, there's one down here too. Much better views here. The 
solid door, we are flooding water through these nozzles at a tune of 150 gallons a second or 9,000 gallons a launch. The engines are right here. When they ignite, instead of sound hitting the bottom of the silo and coming up and destroying this missile, just peeling the skin off like an onion, it instead hits this water and it turns that water to steam. It takes a lot of energy. That energy would have been used to destroy the missiles now just making steam. So when you saw this thing launch, you saw all this white smoke coming up, that's the steam from the water. Now here's the thrust mount. See these large springs? They're 30 foot each. That's made so it can ride out a, a first strike. But when we go to launch, we wedge wedges in there. But also notice these panels in here. They're a foot thick. You can see them out there too. They're full of fiberglass. It's the world's largest glass pack muffler system. It also deadens the noise as that missile's going up and out. So that's how we did it. This facility took 28 months to design and build. Wow. All of them were designed and built in 36 months. They were all done concurrently. So they were designing as they were building it. And surprisingly, there's very few problems with them. The cost was $10.1 million per site to construct. The missile was 2.5, so for 12.6, we had a very nice address, uh, addressable solution to Armageddon. It was this thing. Now, this served three purposes. The largest ICBM we ever built had the largest weapon we ever put on top of one at 9 megatons. Nothing's bigger than that for us. The, the Minuteman today, the Minuteman 3 carry typically 100 kiloton to 300 kiloton. Much smaller. Much more accurate. Second, it was such a good space launch platform that NASA grabbed 12 of these in the 60s and launched astronauts into space. They just didn't call the Titan II. Who would want to get on ICBM and say, hey, look at me? They called the Gemini program. So it was a bridge between the Mercury and the Apollo. Very important program. And then lastly, when they destroyed these places, not because of the SALT Treaty, but because President Reagan was a little upset over that accident in Damascus, and the cost per silo was getting out of hand. Could use that money for other systems. So he, he uh, put it on a decommissioning schedule and they destroyed everything in the site. But the Department of Defense took 14 of these missiles, made them really nice space launch platforms and launched satellites into space all the way up to October 2003 out of Vandenberg. So we got 40 years of service out of this missile system. Pretty good bang for a buck. Okay, we need to go back up top. If you have any questions, just ask.